So today I want to talk about forever yours, um, and I'm going to talk about Jesus' prayer, about us, how it is a forever yours prayer. Forever yours has been used, as I say, to close letters, and they, they close letters when especially there is a close, loving relationships. Christians have a forever relationship with the triune God. That is, we have a relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Jesus gives us this example in his prayers. And in some ways, this uh, sermon today is a tale of the story of the two prayers of Jesus. The one, which is the outline prayer in Matthew chapter 6. The other, the prayer that John records in John chapter 17. So I'd like to read, and, you know, it's, it's amazing how we read things um, sometimes and we, we, we miss so much. Uh, but we'll read this and we'll come back to it. And I say that because when my wife was reading what John wrote in the book of Revelation, and we stop and think about it, the magnitude of, of what is written there for us, that he makes everything new, that he heals everything, uh, that we have, a, we have a new life and we have a life without fear. So Jesus, um, this is his part of his prayer. We're, we're going to look at nine verses, the first nine verses here in John 17. And it says here in John 17, verse 1, After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and he prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all of those you have given him. Now, this is eternal life that you, they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And I brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me. And I have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they have accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you and have believed that you have sent me. I pray for them, and I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. I had begun this sermon several, almost a month ago in my head. That is the thought and, and the beginning to process it. However, in, in that processing, I kept thinking and, and, and scriptures and ideas would come to my mind. But when I went to put it together, and this is kind of one of those interesting things in life, I couldn't find anything that I wanted for this particular sermon because I, you know, I was thinking about forever yours. So I, I was looking up yours and your, and I couldn't find a thing, and I got a bit discouraged. In fact, I was telling my wife, this is not coming together the way that I want. And then it finally hit me after several hours, several hours. The old English doesn't use your. It uses thy. So what I want to talk about today in terms of, and what we see here, and I'm reading from the NIV today where it uses not, you know, thy word or, and the like, it uses your and you. I want us to understand that as far as God is concerned and as far as our life is concerned, we are forever his. And in that forever being his, what we see in the prayer of Jesus, how Jesus emphasizes that. So, I've already read the pr part of the prayer of Jesus. Now let's go back to the book of Matthew when his disciples ask him how to pray. Because they had seen Jesus pray, and they were asking him, well, Lord, how, how do we pray? So I want to just mention here verse 10. 
And please, and this is what is nice about the NIV in this example. Notice what Jesus says here in verse 10. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Now, how long do you think the your is going to be there? Or is, it, is that going to be uh, changed sometime in the millennia ahead where it's, it's our kingdom, my kingdom, my will, my love, my faith, my hope, my joy, my way? Kind of like Frank Sinatra. Frank may have a little bit of a difficulty in, in, in that particular when he's talking about, you know, I, I do things my way. We're looking at doing things God's way eternally. And then it, it ends here with this in, uh, in verse 13 in, in the book of uh, here where he says uh, to us in Matthew, it is about your glory and your power and your might forever and ever. So I know that some f- people feel that, well, that's just an addition because Luke doesn't have it in there in the NRV, um, you know, misses some of that. But it is about your kingdom, your power, your glory, your authority forever. So when we look at this a life in which we live, we live in a, a mind world. This is mine. We live in a self world. A world that attempts to separate from God and his reality that is indeed eternal. So we talk about being forever yours. And we we look at it both in in the past, we were gods. In the present, we are God, in God. And in the future, it is also about that. Interesting enough, Jesus never lost sight of his heavenly father and the oneness of their relationship And this was reflected both in the outline prayer, your kingdom, your will, and also in the prayer of Jesus. So this is, when we think about forever yours, it is a focus on the love of God, the love of Jesus and the Father, and their love for us. God is forever, forever our heavenly Father. Not just for a temporary time, but always for that. And we are able to take on his nature and his spirit. We are to be transformed. We are to be changed. But in our life and what we strive for now is to do things God's way. Because God has the perfect way. Think about all the things that and I've mentioned already about how well we do with, with our love how well we do with our faith. In fact, when you read about it, it becomes a difficulty when we have faith in Jesus as opposed to the faith of Jesus, or that we have our faith. Now, again, as we've talked about, we mentioned so often, I am not walking on water based on my faith. It's, it's not going to happen, and I'm not even going to give it a shot. Not even going to try. Now, the faith, if I had the faith of Jesus, and that's what I want. I want the forgiveness of Christ. Not my forgiveness. How often, in terms of forgiveness, do we come back to the same old things time and time and time and time again? In forever yours... In the forgiveness of Christ, it's wiped clean. Our conscience is wiped clean. It is the, the for, it is the forgiveness of Christ, His kind of forgiveness. It is the love of Christ, His love, not mine. It is the hope of Christ. It is the the faith of Christ. These are the things that we are seeking in our life, and that we want to be like Him. We want to exemplify him. So when we think about God is forever our heavenly father, we are to be his sons and daughters. So when we think again about forever yours, let's take a look at how Jesus gave examples to us to help us to understand that. For example, in John chapter 5, in John chapter 5 and verse 30, 
Here's what Jesus says about his will and what he is doing. In verse 30, he says here to us, By myself, I can do nothing. And also, brethren, by ourselves, do do we want to do anything apart from God? We want to do all things in context with God, in accordance with God. But he says, of myself, I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. This is the desire of Jesus where he says, I, of myself, I can do nothing. He is dependent upon God. I, you know, I, I was thinking of several songs that we have sung over the years, and, you know, I need thee every hour. Um, is that a straight up, quarter past? However, you know, when we think about, we need God all the time. I was thinking about the song, I am thine, O Lord. I, I, I belong to you. And I want to live, I want to do, and I want to be as you want me to be. So with that thought in mind, let's also take a look at how, when we think about, I want to have my own way. I want to be free and independent. Now, God gives us a great deal of latitude, but it is the fact that we're, we're forever connected to him. So let's take a look at Jesus' relationship with the Father. Because in being forever yours, this is how Jesus responded. And certainly the example that we can follow, this is from John chapter 14, verse 23. But And please note, forever yours, the incredible relationship of love that we have here. Jesus replied, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teachings. For how long? Do do we think that Jesus' teaching will go out of date? That we'll have a, let's say, given a million years in the kingdom, we'll have a better idea than Jesus. Say, Lord, I've got some some new technology. I have a better idea. No, we will obey. This is about being close to someone. He he says, I obey his things. Um, I'll figure out where I'm here. He says, obey my teachings. My father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. And he who does not love me will not obey my teachings. These words you hear are not my own, but they belong to the Father who sent me. Now, who is Jesus giving credit to in terms of the words that he is speaking? Remember when he encountered the devil, he did not use his own words. He Rather, he said, it is written. And and it's quick sometimes we as human beings think, well, I've got just the right retort. I got just the right, you know, come back to a situation. No, Jesus uses, used the written word and he used that. So he says, these are not my words. They belong to God, the father who has sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. So we find here, again, a continual uh, a help in terms of being forever yours. It is important. We, can, we cannot be his without the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, without Christ being dwelling in us. You know, the Apostle Paul tells us in the book of Romans, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are sons of God. If we have not the Spirit, we're none of his. But we do have the Spirit of God, and so we belong to him. We are his creation. We are his sons and daughters. So he says, I'll send you, and it will lead you into all things. Now, Jesus makes this other statement, this next statement, peace I leave with you. Now you think, okay, are we capable, you and I capable of engendering peace and keeping peace? I find it quite difficult when, I, I, I find it difficult to keep peace with myself. Yet when you get people in a mix and the more people we have, 
the more the mix, you know, gets mixed up and people become fractious and people become contentious, people are hard to get along with, people love their opinions, their ideas and the like, and they think that they are right. And when we think that we are right, we think everybody else is wrong. And what has this world been involved in since the beginning? War. We have been involved in war after war after war. And our peace, at best, is a cessation of fighting. But it's, it's not a peace. So what Jesus says here, when we think about being forever yours, Jesus says this, my peace. Now, which one of the pieces do we want? Do we want our peace as we see peace? Or do we want his peace? You know, when Jesus is talking about seek ye first the kingdom of God, it also says in there, and his righteousness. Not our righteousness, but his righteousness. So Jesus' Jesus's peace is different than my peace. Because Jesus has absolute perfect faith. He has perfect trust in the Father. He has perfect love for the Father. He has a perfect relationship with the Father. He is in agreement with the Father. Everything the Father tells him to say, he says it, and he says it in the way the Father wants him to say it. Have you ever had somebody tell you to say something to somebody else, and you you, you say it in your own way, with your own tone of voice, your own understanding of it, and you get yourself in hot water? So we find here with Jesus here, he says, my peace, I give you. Now, how are we trying to, we are trying to win peace. We are trying to make peace. We are trying to get our own peace. And Jesus said, my peace, I will give you. Now, if that doesn't make you love our Lord and Savior, and then we say to to, to him, I am forever yours. You have won my heart, my mind, and my soul. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Okay, as much peace and rest as you have today, do you have any fears? Have any fears whatsoever? I was trying to look up my 403B yesterday and it showed up with zero in it. And I'm thinking, oh my, what happened to what I've saved? And, you know, I, I enjoyed eight hours of good sleep last night because I just, I know that it's, I've done something wrong in there and there was some, but anyway, it is so easy to be afraid of everything. You can be, you know, afraid about living, you can be afraid about dying, but the peace that we have that comes from Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior, is so different. He says, don't be afraid. We read also from the book of, going on further in the book of Revelation in chapter 21, it says the fearful and the unbelieving have no place in the kingdom of God. We think about being forever his. We live in a relationship where we can trust and we don't have fear. Then Jesus says, you have heard me say, I am going away and I'm coming back to you. If you love me, you would be glad that I go to the Father. Now, now that's an interesting thing about it. We think about forever yours. We can trust him. We can trust him to be away from us, to be with the Father, to sit at the right hand of the Father and to rule the universe. We can trust him completely because he says, I will come again. But he does say, if you love me, you, you will be glad for me. These are things where... In being forever yours, we rejoice in what Jesus has done, what Jesus is doing, and what Jesus will continue to do. So he says that, and I'll come back to you. If you love me, you'd be glad that I'm going to the Father for the Father. Now, forever yours, look at what Jesus said. The Father is greater than I. This is so contrary to Lucifer. It is so contrary to the devil in the garden who was saying, well, 
you know, you need to do this because you'll be like God, and in essence, you know better than God, and you'll see that God has not treated you fairly in all this. No, Jesus says, the Father is greater than I. Is, is what he I have told you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe. Again, th- this is the trust that we, we hear things in advance so that we will believe. I will not speak with you much longer for the prince of the world is coming and he has no hold on me. So let's, th- let's just take relationships where Jesus says they have, he has no hold on me. So let's say there's a third party in a two-party relationship and you can't trust that. No, forever yours, we know that we can trust Jesus because Satan has no hold, no place with him. And he loves us and he continues to love us. And he, he reminds us of that. But the world must learn that I have loved the Father. Now, this is what is forever. What does Jesus do? He says, the world must know that I have loved the Father and that I do exactly what my Father has commanded me. This is Jesus saying, I am forever his. I am forever in love by heavenly Father. So, These are things that Jesus helps us to see, that it's all about God, and it is all about Christ in us. So let's go and take a look at his prayer and see how his prayer is about forever yours. In John chapter 17, now just a few pages over, we begin in in verse 1. So Jesus is, first of all, looking towards heaven. He's praying And here's what John writes, that Jesus said, Father, the time has come, glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. So Jesus in prayer continues to glorify the Father. Jesus himself is glorified, and so will you and I be glorified. But our being glorified doesn't mean that we take over for God, that we don't listen to God, we don't give our heart, mind, soul, and being to God. In fact, glorify saints who say to the Father, this is what we say, Father, we are forever yours. Glorified saints worship in spirit and in truth. That is what glorified spirits do. And this is what Jesus did. And this is what he is saying. It's now the time which sometimes we have problems with God because we, we think God's timing should be on our schedule. And, and it just hasn't worked that way. It is the ability that we have through the Holy Spirit to realize that God is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning, he is the end, and he has control of everything. In a world the world in which we live now, which the prince of the power of the air has influence and impact upon all all of us. Verse 2 of his prayer here, For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. So Jesus is is our power and has, he is both our power and has all power. Jesus gives us eternal life. And that is to be forever his, to be forever yours. Jesus is our Lord and Savior. So, which, using a scripture the Apostle Paul wrote down in the book of Thessalonians, which mind do you want? Your mind or the mind of Christ? Oh, I'll have, you know, I want to do things my way. I want to think the way I want to think. No, it is to have the mind of Christ. When we think about forever yours, that's what we want. Forever to have the mind of Christ. And if we, I've mentioned this before, if we were to cut off the top of our skull cap and lift it up and take out ours and put the mind of Christ, how different do you think we would be today? 
You, we might be saying, Lord, show me the lake because I'm going to walk on water. We might say, Lord, that mountain over there, I'm going to move and put in a new interstate and all of that, and make it easy, and I'll, I'll fix all these highways just instantly. I can do all of these things. And, you know, if we had the mind of Christ, how differently we would see one another. I want forever to have the mind of Christ, to think the way that Jesus thinks. Verse 3, now this is eternal life that they, this is Jesus' prayer for us, that they may know you. When we thought, think about getting to know God, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Now when we think again about forever yours, and maybe you got that in some love letter when you were a kid or whatever, and, or however it might have been, forever yours. Jesus is saying, I want you to know my Father. And my Father also wants you, and I want you to know me. Because if you ever know me, you will be forever mine and my father's, and your life will be forever different. So when you look at this here, and knowing is in the love, of, you know, forever yours. Knowing brings us into belonging to him. And we think about forever yours, we think about yours, we, we think about belonging, it brings that we belong to him. And belonging in a, an eternal life and in a loving relationship. This is what God is, this is his prayer for us. Now notice here what Jesus does there in verse 4, where he says here in verse 4, I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Jesus wasn't about glorifying himself. He says, Father, I have brought glory upon you by completing the work that you have given me to do. And for individuals like ourselves, that we recognize that it's all about the Father, all about the work that God has given Jesus to do, that he did, and the work that he has given us to do as well. So when we think about the scripture the Apostle Paul wrote to us, he says, we are his workmanship created unto good works. He has good works for us to do that glorify him, and because we're forever his, we are wanting to do those works. Verse 5, he says, And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had before the world began. Oh, my, you think about someone who is forever yours, and Jesus is saying, Glorify me in your presence with the glory I had before. You know, think about what God has in mind for us. It is beyond our imagination. And we are glorified. The glory of God lives within us. Remember the, the song, the call to worship? This is Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. That we are glorified by having Jesus in us. God's glory goes back a long ways. And when Jesus says, before the world was. Now, what kind of glory does Jesus, again, forever yours, does Jesus want us to have? Well, in this same chapter, and I'm, I'm jumping ahead, I, you know, we're only doing the first nine verses, but for, for us to explain this, let's read what, what he has in mind for us in verse 21 through 24 of John chapter 17. And here's what Jesus tells us here in verse 21. He's speaking about, he's prayed for those uh, and, and those that will believe this message in verse 20, for the purpose that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe. Our being one is so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are. We think about God transforms us. He changes us from the inside out that we may be one. And then he says, I and them and you and me, 
They, may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you have sent me and I have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I, verse 24, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory. The glory you have given me because, because what? Because you love me before the creation of the world. Forever yours. Jesus, the Son of God, has forever been his. He has forever been glorious in the Father's sight. Jesus' glory goes way, way back. And for what purpose then? What did Jesus do with that glory? Now let's go back when we think about forever yours, what Jesus, and this is about doing everything God's way. Jesus exemplifies that way, helps us as human beings to understand that as our high priest, as he said when he came on the Sermon on the Mount, you've heard things in times past, but I'm telling you, Jesus gives us a new way so that we can be forever his. Verse, now in verse 6 of John 17, for what purpose? He tells us here in verse 6, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. Notice then what he says, who do they belong to? They are yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. He talks about obeying his commandments, but those words came from his heavenly father. Those are eternal words. Those are words, as Jesus said, these are words of life. And what Jesus was doing was magnifying the name of the Father. So when we look, for example, at the outline prayer, how does Jesus start it off? Our Father, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Great and awesome and wonderful. Kind of like when you start a letter, dear God. But is dear God enough? My dearest holy loving, heavenly Father. You know, this, this incredible salutation. And what we're going through today is kind of the body of the letter. We're, we're talking about the things that make up our life and change us, that make us forever his. And we're about to come to that conclusion where we're going to sign off forever yours. So he manifested. You know, Jesus is making known the Father. What is he making known? His kingdom, his will. His love, his faithfulness, his glory. That is what he is making known. Verse 7, what does he go on to tell us here in his prayer? Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. Everything comes from God. So we need to understand that. In the book of Acts, the apostle Paul puts it this way in Acts chapter 17 and verse 28. In him we live, we move, we have our being. It is in God that we have life and we have eternal life. Now, what does he say in verse 8 then in terms of being forever yours? In verse 8 he says, For I gave them the words you gave me and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you and they believed that you sent me. That God has the power. He's, he's the one who, who has sent us. These words were given to him. Now he says it a little differently. Previously in John chapter 12, verse 49 and 50, where here's what Jesus said when we talk about, again, about doing things God's way and always being his way. In verse 49 of John chapter 12, he says, For I did not speak of my own accord, but the Father who sent me commanded me what to say, and how to say it. Now there's two things that are very, very important. What to say, and then how do you say it? We tend to think, well, if I, I'll just say what I, want, what I need to say. No, that is not the, that is not the mind of Christ. It's, it's not only what to say, but how you say it. And how often, brethren, have we got ourselves in trouble by how we say things? We say things with an attitude. 
We say things, you know, in our, in our tone of voice. We say all kinds of things. We don't say it the way Jesus would say it. Uh, Paul writes this in the book of Ephesians where he says, speak the truth in love. I don't know of an example where Jesus spoke the truth in hate. But Jesus, you know, he raised his voice at times, but he always spoke the truth in love for all of us. So it's how to say it. So, but he, he gives the Father credit in terms of saying, the Father tells me what to say and how to speak. Now this also then, and going back now to John chapter 17, in the prayer of Jesus, in verse 9, he tells us this, in verse beginning here in verse 9 now, I pray for them. Now you talk about God who loves us, a Savior who loves us. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but that those you've given for me, for they are yours. Jesus prays for us. How long has he been praying for us? Has he stopped? You know, I'm, I'm reminded of the book of Hebrews that says that he ever lives to be intercede for us. He ever lives on our behalf to do that. For they are yours. We belong to God. So when Matthew writes there in, in the outline prayer, and Jesus is telling them how to pray, yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory for how long? Forever. Forever. We brethren, we brethren are also forever. And we, our relationship with Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, with our Heavenly Father, we say to God, as to those that we might love and the like, I am forever yours. For all eternity. And I love it. I hope you do as well. Love being forever yours to our God. Let's conclude in prayer. Father, we thank you very much for your blessings, for your love, for your truth, for the prayer of Jesus, the outline there. And in all of these things, Father, it is about you, our Heavenly Father. And as we read from the book of Revelation, a new heaven, a new earth, a new life, a new us, glorified. May we truly be forever yours to your glory and praise and honor. In Jesus' name we give you thanks. Amen. The world today is a challenging environment for Christian believers and followers of Jesus Christ. Looking for answers? Grace Communion International local churches in Fairfield, Santa Rosa, and Modesto offers a comforting environment for Christians in search of spiritual growth and development. Contact a local ministry. Attend the local GCI churches at the times listed on your screen.